Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I am here with Wick Grosbeck, who is the lead owner of the Boston Celtics. Wick, good to see you. You we too, could, Diane. Nice to see you again. I feel like we could be doing uh, something on your band, too, because I see one of your guitars in the background, which we will get to. You're a man of many talents. Look, I was very interested in doing a leadership interview with you because I think you have such an interesting background and also your sort of current interest. But let me start with what you wanted to be when you grew up, because I see you've got a history degree from Princeton. You did law at University of Michigan, Stanford MBA. What was all that in pursuit of? Well, as I grew up as a kid outside of Boston, I definitely wanted to play for one of the Boston teams. I, that's absolutely true. Uh, my best sport was probably baseball back then, not that it was that terrific. Um, but I, I stuck with the sports idea. And in college, I walked on to become a rower. So I rowed crew. Yeah. And, uh, and our boat went undefeated my senior year. And we sort of won everything we could win. And uh, we had a great team. The teammates are still friends to this day, 40 years later. And so it was a formative experience for me to put that much into something. And I found in myself, thanks to the coaching and thanks to the other guys, but somehow found like a sixth or seventh gear inside that I didn't really have. I was sort of just going along and 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 a, a bookish kind of uh, teenager and, you know, uh, became more focused on what I could accomplish, um, you know, if I put myself to it, so I put my mind to it. So that led 20 years later to saying, I want to take that energy and power and competitiveness and turn it into my, my work. And so uh, to the idea of buying the Celtics. Before we get to the Celtics, you mentioned baseball. Is it true that you were originally interested out when you were out on the West Coast, when you were with, I guess, um, Highland Capital Partners, that you looked at the Oakland A's, the San Francisco Giants? Were you equally passionate about buying those teams if uh, the opportunity had come available? Well, actually, you're really uh, referring to, in that case, my father, although I was involved in helping him look uh, in, a, in a small way. But uh, oh, so my it was, father it was Irv. Um, Irv uh, from Stanford Business School, Harvard Business School as a professor and then Stanford. Before that, Continental Cable Vision was his company. And so he's always had the bug uh, to own the Red Sox, frankly, or another MLB team. And he looked at several. And uh, so that's where in our family, the conversation towards owning a team began. And now my father's my partner here in uh, the Celtics, along with another other, a number of other uh, great investors. Well, he was your partner too, obviously, when you were forming this uh, investor group to buy the Celtics. Um, was it hard to convince him to pivot over to the world of basketball? Uh, he was very excited from the minute I mentioned it to him, uh, and I'm very appreciative of that. And he made a significant investment in it, but it still left room. It was uh, it was a nice investment. But as he himself said, I'm going to put in less than I could because I want you to be very proud of this cause, because this is your deal entirely, you know, or, or this is your deal. We'll be partners, but I'm going to actually do less so that you can not feel that anything was ever you know, given to you. And, and, and so I think that was really prescient of him and very thoughtful of him. So we have 20 other partners uh, and it took every bit of my energy for three and a half months uh, to raise the money to buy the Celtics and to bring this partnership together. And we're basically all still together 20 years later and they're incredible people. And we're, our partnership has stood the test of time. One thing I'm curious about is how do you get buy-in um, when you've got that many investors, you've not owned a team before, although you've, you know, you may be a passionate athlete. How do you build trust in that situation that uh, you're going to do well by them and by the investment? I give them a lot of credit. They, they believed in the concept and, and took a big leap in believing in me as the day to day CEO and kind of controlling decision maker. Um, and, and, and I appreciate that I was 41 years old and I'd never really had an employee before, except a, a fantastic assistant who's still, we're still partnered, uh, administratively, but, um, it was a leap, but I think the real, let's, let's face it. The real key is I got the exclusive right to buy the Boston Celtics. I found the owner it was a publicly traded company. I asked him if he would sell it. Uh, 
30 seconds later, we had a handshake. I said, I'll give you the money in three and a half months. Here's a deposit. You can keep the deposit no matter what. And all of a sudden, I had the right to buy the Celtics. And I think that's that was the, um, you know, the flame and, and the moths uh, came. But we, we uh, I told my partners to be, this is the last Boston team that's going to sell in our lifetimes. We're going to have the time of our lives. Imagine if we win, how, we're, how we'll feel, how the parade will be and the rings and the banner and the trophy and the good we can do in the community. And so it sold itself, I, I, but they believed in me as well and I'm extremely grateful. It's interesting, I think you bought it for 360 million, if I'm not mistaken. Was I don't know if that was perceived as, as fair market value at the time. I know now it's, you know, according to us, it's, it's worth more than 4 billion. I'm sure that's probably on the lower end at this point. Um, was it seen as a bargain at the time or were people thinking you had, were throwing a lot of money at this? Oh no, um, some very astute investors uh, whom I respect and am friendly with to this day told me I was crazy. It was a vast overpayment. The Celtics were actually publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange at yeah. the time. So anybody watching, uh, many people watching this uh, will remember that. And, um, and they were trading down in the, I don't know, 130, 150 range, something like that, as I recall. But this buyout, it was an LBO and we organized it and I felt like the cash flow would cover some debt service, but leave us room to improve it. I just penciled it out without worrying about what anybody else thought, particularly, except I did worry about what my 20 partners thought uh, and they all came into their credit. Um, but but we didn't do it to say this is going to be a great return. We did it thinking that the return would be in emotional satisfaction and joy uh, and heartbreak of losing games. But we, we, I, we explicitly agreed up front that this wasn't supposed to outperform other stocks or anything like that. It's supposed to be uh, fun money doing great stuff. And, and so a decision of the heart, a decision of the heart. And it somehow turned into uh, a, a truly um, <laughs> extraordinary investment. But since we're not selling, it doesn't really matter. OK, we've got that out of the way. Wick is not selling the Boston Celtics. I'm sure people ask you a lot, but what were some of the um, critical decisions? We can even jump ahead to the one that was just in the news, you know, about the trade that you made. But when you think about what you've learned over the years and what you did that you think were essential pivot points in making the team what it is today, what would you identify? Um, well, it, it, People who know me wouldn't say humility the first thing I, I'm afraid uh, to say, but um, I think being a, I, I think I've learned over the years, or I hope I've tried to learn to be a teammate, a good teammate, and uh, a person who knows, uh, you know, what he doesn't know. I've, I've said I don't have a basketball mind. I can't draw up plays or figure out which player to draft among, you know, the top 50 in college every year. And so I'm not going to try. I'm not going to try to get into the way of that. And so then to be able to team up with people like Danny Ainge and Doc Rivers and Brad Stevens and now Joe mm -hmm. Missoula, um, these are general managers and coaches. And to team up with, for example, Steve Paliuka, my partner at the Celtics, who played on the Duke basketball team and knows basketball and uh, helps with basketball, you know, leads our basketball committee. Um, so I'm trying to be a good teammate. You ought to interview them and see how we how I'm doing. But I mean, the, the well, fact is, it's, it's a team effort at the Celtics. It's not a one person show. What would you do over if you could? Uh, I well, with another partner, I had opportunity to bid on the uh, uh, one NHL team and one original six National Hockey League team. And those both would have been great investments. But we fell a little bit short in the bidding of those. This was a few years after we did the Celtics. But in terms of the Celtics, it's gone so well. I won't say our decisions were all perfect. That... There are trades. There are trades I regret. I regret trading Kendrick Perkins away, uh, sort of halfway through our tenure. He was a great player. We thought the team might get a little bit better, and we really didn't. Um, and I approve all the trades or disapprove them. So it really is on my desk. Um, I still miss Burke, but we're still friends to this game, to this day. You know, I, I want to mention. Uh, you know, earlier this year, Jalen Brown. Um, there was a contract, I believe, for $304 million, which is the largest in NBA history. Um, talk a little bit about him and, and how critical he is to you. Or, or Obviously, that's a lot of money. You're making a big bet. Why so much? He is a uh, bedrock part. He's 
you know, we've got two real superstar players uh, and have now added a couple more all-stars to that over the last few weeks. But um, but Jalen is just somebody we wanted to build around. And in terms of winning a ch another championship or winning as many games as possible, he is, we think, essential. But we also think that his community devotion, his character, his, uh, he's just extremely insightful and thoughtful about matters far beyond basketball. And he uh, represents a person that we absolutely want to be, you know, we want to have him here as long as we can. Do you think you can buy your way to greatness or to win a win in the NBA or any other sport? I think the um, it helps to be able to invest behind your convictions to add players who are highly paid. So um, there's a correlation between spending on payroll and uh, and achievement, but it's not a perfect correlation. And there's also there are also a number of times when you'll see a team that's very expensive, but it'll sort of fall apart. So I would really would I would like to emphasize um, if you've got the right chemistry around a team, if you've got the right sort of guys and there's a strong bond and there's a shared mission. And then some of the outlier guys who might be coming from somewhere else and not really, they sort of gravitate to doing it how it's being done. You know, you've got to have that good momentum and feeling in the team. There's got to be a connection. Um, then you get the connection with the fans and with ownership. And that's when I've seen it really work. So um, I don't think it's, I, you can't buy your way to greatness. Um, you know, investing in a team definitely helps. But you've got to invest emotionally as well. You know, um, talk a little bit about the latest trade, because according to the news reports I saw before sitting down here, a lot of people are now very optimistic about the Celtics uh, chances. Can you tell a little bit about the thinking behind that? We added Drew Holiday, a, a, an all star point guard um, who had until recently been at our sort of one of our arch rivals, the Milwaukee Bucks, mm -hmm. owned by my friend and tequila partner in Sincoro Tequila, Wes Edens. Um, I was at dinner with Wes uh, two nights ago, and when we were secretly trying to make this trade with another team, Portland, but but um, you got him drunk, sent, and then what happened? No. Well, yeah, no, he, Wes was already out. He had already sent Drew away uh, to Portland uh, three days before, so it was out of his hands. But and so Drew got rerouted to us. But um, we lost two players in the trade that we you know our fans are going to miss um but we we gained an all-star and this is the kind of tough decision you don't get uh something for nothing you know in the league you've got to trade and match salaries and all that stuff and so we lost um uh two really high quality players malcolm brogdon and rob williams the third but we got back jeru and he we hope that he can lead us we think our starting lineup right now is uh really strong you know, Wick, I want to step back a second because even when you mentioned sort of that this was a decision of the heart and that this is fun, there is sometimes a perception that sports team owners, it's a money game. You know, it's the sort of thing that, you know, you mentioned Wes Eden, Steve Ballmer, whoever, that this, it, it's that if you have enough money, you invest in a good property and, you know, away it goes. What do you think are the skill sets that are really critical to be a successful team owner? And you can make it about you know basketball or any other sport. Mm -hmm. Well, I see it around the table at the owners' meetings, and I and I've gotten to know a, a whole bunch of NFL, Major League Baseball, and even hockey owners um, over the past twenty years. So I, I, I probably know you know seventy or eighty owners, and mm -hmm. we all really want to compete and win. It's beyond the money uh, to this group, but just walking in from another business and thinking you can you know live somewhere else and then direct it remotely or give sort of written instructions and then sit back and not be involved. I think you've got to be at, you know, practices and games and on the team plane just to soak in how the coach is connecting with the players, who seems to be, um, you know, bringing the right energy. And, and you know, you can just see if it's a healthy organism or if it's not going that well. And we have ups and downs. Uh, Celtic seasons, the last couple of seasons, we've had really good teams and they, they fell short in the end. And um, and so we we made a bunch of changes this year because uh, we all decided and I I decided to make make the changes. I wasn't happy with how it ended up last year. I, I'm not sure that was exactly answering your question, but you can't yeah. 
I don't believe this is like manufacturing. This is not manufacturing. This is a very emotional, very people driven business. It's a partnership with the players. It's a partnership with the fans. And if you're not a fan yourself, you're going to have a hard time partnering with the players, the fans, team partners and taking it all the way. It's a very public role too, right? Can't hide if you're a, if you're a team owner. So um, I do want to ask, because we're talking about leadership, uh, any mentors or where you get, uh, you know, when you're the top guy, it's hard to really sort of get advice from within your own ecosystem. Maybe start with your dad. As you mentioned, he uh, co-founded Continental Cable Vision in 1963, very accomplished, you know, businessman in his own right. Um, did, was he an important influence on you as a leader? Or is he? Uh, I should say, is he, not was he? He is. I mean, he's been a, it's been a great partnership for 20 years and a great uh, relationship for 60 years, let's say. Um, rounding Lucky down you. 62 years. Um, but he's a, uh, and he's, he's taught so many people and they come up to me all the time and say, are you related, you know, and so on. Um, so yes, uh, my college coach, Curtis Jordan, um, really taught me to row, taught me to be uh, able to compete on that team and led us all to, you know, the beginnings of our successful run. And I'm still in touch, touch with Curtis to this day. I have a lot to thank him for as two examples that come to mind. Um, and then let me ask you, what's on your radar you would put on ours? And because you've got a lot of interest. You mentioned the tequila, of course. I know you're also very involved in the community with regard to the hospital and some of the causes that are close to your heart. Um, what really drives you at this point, gets you up in the morning and when you think about the impact you want to make, you know, how do well, you think about really, it now versus when you started? Right. Uh, the Celtics to me are as important now, if not more in my life than they were uh, 20 years ago when I came in and I, it was all encompassing 20 years ago. So I really don't want to, and, and we are, uh, I, and then I'll move on to maybe a quickly touch on another thing or two, but you know, the Celtics mm -hmm. in the community, um, we've, we have a huge, you know, $25 million effort to start to remedy local effects of social injustice called Celtics United. We help 1500 yep. charity a year, make 200 player appearances a year. You know, we do, I, I mean, so that, that can not only take up your time, but it can satisfy and challenge and enthrall you on a daily basis, even after 20 years. Amelia and I are doing a lot of uh, philanthropic giving. We're lucky to be able in that position. Um, she's got a really, Amelia Fazolari, my wife, uh, who you know from a past career. 50, at yes, uh, and 50 over 50 listers. So, uh, you know, very the, accomplished. The only part she didn't like about that was the over 50, but she was gratified for the first 50. What you, I what hear you. you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. But Amelia and I are, she's got a new initiative, uh, giving scholarships to really uh, deserving and underprivileged kids in Italy, where her family is from, as an example. So we're we're doing the Earthshot Initiative with uh, William and Kate a little bit, the, being limited partners of theirs, junior partners of theirs. So we're excited to be um, trying to make the world a little bit a better place. Is there anything else you want to add in terms of, again, let's say that for the Celtics fans or foes who are watching, what message do you want to give them? Uh, I. I don't, well, I would say I had a dream, you know, 40, uh, excuse me, 20 years ago to become, you know, it just suddenly occurred to me, maybe I could get a hold of the Celtics, but I would need to bring in a bunch of partners. And, and I followed that idea, you know, a hundred miles an hour. I lost 17 pounds over three months trying to raise the money with, with all these meetings. I found 20 plus of the greatest partners I can imagine, but we didn't know at the time. And it worked. And so this is really a dream come true. And I don't mean in any way other than gratefully. I don't mean it boastfully. It was a dream. It was a good idea. But who knew? And because other people were able to come in and partner, I couldn't have done it without them, couldn't have. Um, I just, I'm, I'm appreciative. I'm appreciative of the fans. I love what I do. Um, I can't wait for the season to start, which is in just a few weeks. So follow your dreams. I mean, it's a, it's a cliche, but, but sometimes uh, they can come true. Thanks very much for joining us, Wick. Can't think of a better place to end than there. Always nice to speak with you, Diane. Thanks so much for the invitation. Thank you.